Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Going Nuclear. I'm here with a very, very special guest. We are in New York City today and with a very special guest, Carl Perez. He became a CEO of a nuclear startup at the age of 21. He is an entrepreneur and uh, he's an entrepreneur in the nuclear industry, which is actually quite rare. So I'm really excited. Carl, welcome. Osama, thank you for having me. And on the contrary, you know, you're you're my guest here in New York, um, you know, at, at our office. Uh, but uh, as Osama mentioned, uh, I am uh, currently the, the co-founder as well as the CEO of Exodus Energy. Uh, prior to that, when uh, when I was a senior in undergrad, I made uh, my first attempt in the nuclear industry with Elysium Industries, which was uh, a developer of molten salt reactors. And uh, now we're spending much more time on actually molten salt based recycling. So we're very excited to def definitely delve into the details of, you know, how that came to be. Um, but yeah, I'll let you I'll let you take the lead. But more importantly, just thank you for having me. Thank you for what you do for the industry, frankly, getting much more technical information, stories out um, in a new way. So, again, thank you for being here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Uh, the, I, I think the, the city is beautiful. It's fantastic. And it's <laughs> and it's great to see this vibrant uh, community here of, of nuclear advocates in New York City. So, you know, let's start from the beginning, right? Tell us, tell us about uh, your background, going to university. What inspired you to to enter this industry? And and also as an entrepreneur, t tell me about that journey. You know, it, it, it's it's funny, obviously, that you mentioned the beauty of, of, of New York, and New York has uh, it's 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 a lot of mixed feelings uh, being pro nuclear and in New York. Uh, you we were at an event yesterday where you just see a, a burgeoning industry and, and the reality is that's not what it looked like for the past decade at least and just to kind of zoom back on on my origin story so born and raised in new york to french algerian uh, parents um, so obviously they immigrated here i grew up uh, in new york city and uh, in fact I, I grew up right next to the natural gas plant of con ed um, on 14 well 14 to like 18th Street and uh, Avenue C. So what's incredible is we don't often think about this, but there's actually a natural gas facility literally inside Manhattan. And a lot of times when we're thinking about natural gas plants or other types of power plants, we're trying to think that they're far away. Um, and in fact, you know, I'll definitely show it you know, to you from the window and you can even see it, you know, a couple of them in, in Brooklyn. So my first exposure was I was playing soccer actually at the soccer field that was given by Con Edison for the local community, which was, frankly, a bit more impoverished than it is today, because as you've seen, prices have just skyrocketed in the United, in, the, in Manhattan specifically, um, but even just New York generally. And so going every single day to practice and seeing these four massive chimneys just spewing out smoke, you, you, you ask yourself, what is that? Is it clean? When you see that the windowsills in Stytown, Peter Cooper Village, right in front of it, the GI Bill, actually, um, so it's basically public housing for, for veterans. When you see the windowsills with you know, a bunch of dust and, and from, from the plants, you, you realize the extent to which air pollution is a real issue in, in the city on top of vehicle congestion. And so at that point, there were really two events. So I was going, you know, I was going to this field when I was four or five years old. And then there were really two edifying events that got me into nuclear. The first one was actually September 11th. Uh, because here you are at, uh, at this time, I was in third grade, and you have two planes hitting the ten Twin Towers, you have the entire city in panic, we couldn't even go home because I was actually going to school, French school, uh, in, the, in the Upper East Side, and being able to, to go downtown was impossible, you were blocked, so we had to stay at, at sleep at friend's house, you see all, this, all the sheetrock smoke in, in the city, it was, it was definitely a war zone, and the first question you're asking yourself is, why? Why, why would someone do that? Why would people be even emboldened to do that? Why would they celebrate that? And so I reassure you, this is by no means, you know, trying to, you know, rationalize or, or you know, <laughs> but what, what I really understood is there's a lot of geopolitical strife uh, in the world that is due to extreme poverty. And one of the first elements that really puts you into poverty is the lack of electricity. You know, and, and in fact, there was a, a movie called Juice that was produced recently, uh, I want to say like maybe three, three years ago. And you, you had one of the speakers and it's something that hit me, but it's just so true. There's over a billion people that consume less electricity than your refrigerator by just being on, which is a crazy fact. 
And so when you look at energy poverty, then there is like the next level, which is the resource curse. So a lot of the countries that are gifted with natural reserves of oil or they, they tend to go through the resource curse where you have the French, the Ameri you know, the US who are, who are trying to get a hold of, 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 this, of this source to be able to stabilize the price of oil. And so what was interesting is seeing how, you know, coming back to, to September 11th, there are a lot of people that are extremely poor in the other types of the world and they're particularly sensitive to radical ideas because they live in extreme poverty. And it's, it's definitely, you know, why would you try to pilot a plane and, and, and kill yourself? It's because you're, you're not enjoying a wonderful life. And so really that's where, where my first dabbling of the thought, okay, whatever I'm gonna do when I'm a grown up is going to be something that eliminates poverty. So that was the first, the first, you know, big step. And and the energy aspect came a little later when 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 I understood how correlated energy access and, and poverty are. And the second edifying event was still in New York, the blackout. So on my tenth birthday, uh, on August fourteenth, you know, two thousand three, there was a, so everybody could do the math on my ages, but we had the entire of entirety of New York go blackout. And, and you had almost the entire East Coast. And I think it was due to um, some transmission system or, or uh, like an inverter in Ohio that completely like messed up the grid. And it was crazy because I live on the 31st floor of a, of a, of a building and uh, at the time. And so going up and down, you, you just realize how electricity is omnipresent, right? So, so I actually lived through energy poverty for you know roughly almost 48 hours. And, uh, and that already was enough. And so when, when I put those two events together, you know, third grade, you know, 10 years old, then I was, I was with the Con Edison exposure, <laughs> it was, I was for sure going to get involved in some way or form in the energy space and in helping alleviate energy poverty. Fast forward to high school, going to college. I went to a university called Babson College, which was phenomenal because I actually went to develop a social enterprise that was going to try to help build bridges um, in the Middle East by using entrepreneurship. So whether it was developing, you know, telecom projects between countries that don't necessarily collaborate with each other as a means of saying, you don't necessarily have to like each other, but at least if, if everyone's winning, then then it's a win-win and you can create economic interdependency interdependen interdependen that way. And very easily we realized, well, how are we going to build telecom infrastructure if the electricity access is not even there? or not even sufficient. And so then I started getting active in renewables and, and kind of the backstory to this is, my father actually protested against the construction of nuclear power plants in France uh, in the late 70s. And so I was actually raised anti-nuclear for the reasons of weapons proliferation, nuclear waste, um, amongst a whole other series of, of, of issues, which I later realized were a bit overblown. Uh, because just clearly I did not have the technical know-how and, and I wasn't exposed to the data and it wasn't as democratized as it is today. So I went to Babson College, it's a school that's known for its entrepreneurship. And can you learn entrepreneurship at school? It's by going through entrepreneurship that you really learn about it. And, and, and it typically costs a lot of hours of, of sleep that, you don't, that you'll never get again. It's, uh, for, for some people, it's definitely the best, it's the most fun you never want to have ever again. <laughs> but, you know, jokes aside, uh, it was great because I was really in an environment that was conducive to even the wildest of ideas. And so when I shifted from that you know, telecom infrastructure type project to getting involved in renewables, I was looking at different places to possibly do that. And uh, I realized that a lot of the places where we wanted to deploy were in places where there was no electricity. And you tell yourself, you don't know, some electricity is better than no electricity, irrespective of the price. But that was not a very smart <laughs> uh, comment because at the end of the day, price is what allows the access, right? So, so you could have the generation capability, but if you can't pay your electricity bill, you will not have electricity. So I was a big fan of uh, renewables and I, and I still am. Uh, I'm just a bit more understanding what are the limitations, right? Like the real cost of renewables was not just the solar array or the wind turbines. It was also all the added transmission cost and, and all the upgrades that you need. So it's not, a lot of the times we don't really integrate the systems based, you know, system wide cost of um, renewables. So I think that, you know, when you're really going up to like 100, maybe even 200 megawatts, it's, it's a very efficient system, less so than efficient performance. But I think where, where nuclear is just an uncontestable winner, is when you're starting to generate a gigawatt, you know, within a building. And and so many facilities, I mean, in Canada, you have, what, 6.7 mega uh, gigawatts on the same site. I mean, you cannot, there's no better way to amortize you know, <laughs> 
10 kilometers a square, you know, square footage. It's it, or you know, 10 square kilometers um, of facility. So I mean, it's it, these are wonders of the world, uh, and I think those have really perpetuated the, the the nuclear narrative in terms of really being a mainstay in, in in the in the fight for clean energy. And so very quickly, I understood that being anti-nuclear was not being pro-environmentalist, and uh, I had my mixed opinion on uh, light water reactors given that there was fukushima chernobyl and a lot of times when you're being said oh these are human factors it's not the technology's fault it's not i don't think that's enough if there's one thing that is infinite it's human error and so being able to take away the human factors in the operation of a nuclear facility is also is also important making sure that basically what you do in the event of emergencies do nothing wait for the system to shut off, wait for whatever leak to leak, and then basically go troubleshoot that in. It's the reason why when I was a senior in undergrad at Babson, I decided, you know, let's, let's, let's make a nuclear reactor company, but let's make a nuclear reactor company to make the reactor that we wish we had. And, and the perspective was, even if we're not successful, let's just keep evangelizing the technology to the point where everyone else is doing it, so then we can actually buy a molten salt reactor that would be <clears throat> sufficient. So I kind of jumped the gun by saying molten salt reactor because I wasn't a nuclear engineer, so I had no passion for one design or the other. So what we did is we basically co-founded the, the company with a couple of people from the Naval Reactor Program, like Ed Fao, uh, who was part of the Advanced Concepts Group, worked a lot in integration. And uh, he's designed reactors for submarine, aircraft carriers, uh, space reactors, and so many other applications that I'll never find out about, <laughs> unless it's declassified. Uh, so so it, was, it was great because when we were looking at the space, we told ourselves, there maybe how many nuclear power plants have we built since the 1980s? And it was like three, four. Um, whereas the Naval Reactor pump, you know, Program is, is pumping a lot of them there. there. I think I heard recently I think the Navy has roughly like 400 reactors. I mean, it's significant. And so that level of expertise in designing is, is just unique in the world. If you're an operator of a nuclear facility, that's great, but it's just like a car mechanic. The car mechanic can read instructions and troubleshoot, but designing the reactor, that's a whole other job. And so we decided to build our team around these naval reactor designers because they were the only ones that had repetitive experience doing so. And more importantly, they were the only ones that actually were able to kind of think outside the box of light water reactors. And so we basically posed the constraints. No weapons, no waste, no, uh, no explosions like uh, meltdowns. Uh, and it was funny because, and, and it has to be economical. And so obviously the team looked at us and said, there's no such thing as a perfect system. And so it, it definitely created a lot of debate within the team where they were saying you're over designing or at least you're giving us ridiculous constraints. And um, upon doing basically a thorough review of the entire nuclear space, we realized that molten salt reactors uh, had a very high potential to, to address all of those factors at once. It's not a perfect system, uh, but what we found out is that a, a specific variant on the molten salt reactor. So the one that was built in the 1960s at Oak Ridge used fluoride salts, it was in a thermal spectrum. That doesn't necessarily get you as far when it comes to waste consumption, right? So using a fast neutron system with chloride salts allowed for better solubility of uranium plutonium, actually lower corrosion uh, when it comes to chloride salts versus fluoride salts. So relative to the output that we wanted, which was over a gigawatt, because we wanted to be a small modular reactor but not fixed at 300 megawatts, which is an arbitrary power output for a small modular. I mean, if we're talking about small, we're talking about physically small. Um, in fact, most small modular reactors actually would be three meters to five meters higher than a 1.2 gigawatt molten salt reactor. So it's interesting how the molten salt reactor was conceived for um, airplanes, uh, for Bombardier. So similar to submarines, it, you, you were able to power the Air Force planes with these reactors. And the idea was you'd be able to push and pull on the throttle uh, to be able to modify uh, the speed very quickly. And that's the reason why they had a liquid fuel as opposed to a solid fuel. So instead of using solid uranium, you liquefy the uranium and you melt it in its coolant because it would allow you to basically dictate the power output by the speed of pumping as opposed to the surface area or the amount of fuel that you have in there. So one of the inconvenience is for a molten salt fast chloride reactor, for example, the minimum area or geometry that you need to go critical is quite significant. It, it, 
It depends if you're only running on plutonium or if you're only running, but at the end of the day, we're looking at like a 3.5 meter diameter for, for, for the vessel. So if you're gonna use that type of, of reactor, a core reactor vessel, might as well pump, you know, 1200 megawatts out of it as opposed to, to, to 10. Um, a lot of it actually has to do with the fact that in the past I've worked in, um, in product financing and wow, financing nuclear power plants could be the best thing in the world, just like it could be the worst thing. The best thing once it's operational and you flip the switch on a gigawatt scale facility, that's $500 million of electricity sales per unit every year. So if you have a valve that leaks or you have you know, a pipe rupture or you have anything, even in the power conversion system, you have margin because whatever reparative action or licensing action you take on place, whatever that cost is covered by, by the revenue that you generate. The reason why we kind of stayed away from the lower outputs is because really the business models that generate electricity that's a bit more expensive in locations that have less or have very expensive electricity. So we didn't believe that we'd be able to make a significant dent in addressing energy poverty, which was our reason to be. And the other thing is, if we are trying to add power for over a billion people in the world, we, we need to be using the least amount of materials per megawatt hour generated. And so we were trying to basically have these molten star reactors that would pump out 1.2 gigawatts. So you can basically co-locate five or six of them similar to Bruce and be able to completely decarbonize an urban center like New York. So we spent roughly seven years developing this molten salt reactor. And back in the day in 2015, one of the highest risks on our register was how do we get a hold of high assay, low enriched uranium? So obviously there are a lot of you know, couldn't sell is like watching this this channel. But for those who, who, who aren't familiar, basically when you have uh, enriched uranium, the, the uranium that you use in light water reactors today are roughly enriched to 5%. What does that mean? It means that 5% of that uranium fuel is an isotope, which is called uranium-235, and it's a fissile material. So it basically is able to fission uh, and basically send neutrons to fertile material, which is the U-238 in the fuel which is obviously non-fissile, but obviously can be transmuted uh, if there's enough uh, neutrons. So a lot of the advanced reactors, if not most, and us as well, when we're working, working on the molten salt reactor, we realize that if we're really to optimize burn up, have a longer fueling cycle for, for our reactor, the best would be to use HALU, which is high assay, low enriched uranium. So it's another version of low enriched uranium between five and 20% U-235. And I say 20%, but it's 19.999. So, so you, you never want to be even in that 12, you know, in that in that 19.99. If anything, you want to be modeling maybe at most for 1975 because you, you can't, even in fabrication, it's very hard to get that level of, of, uh, of precision. And, uh, and so we told ourselves, you know what? If we don't want to be dependent on HALU, let's start looking at what it would take to actually use spent nuclear fuel. And so we did a test five years ago. We didn't want to be reliant on the HALU supply chain. So we told ourselves, let's see what we can do when it comes to using waste. And on five years ago, on the anniversary of Chernobyl, uh, so, so it was also you know meaningful for us, you know, for anti-nukes, we actually took used MOX. So for those who are unfamiliar, MOX is basically recycled fuel uh, from a process called Purex, which is most commonly done in France, at La Hague. Uh, and that's really the only significant commercial recycling facility in the world uh, for that. So they produce a fuel called MOX. It's used in a couple of reactors. Not all of them are, are dimensioned for that or, or even you know, capable of, of taking that material, but more and more are. So it, it, it was great news that we were able to take a material that even La Hague has trouble treating. In fact, MOX cannot even be treated at La Hague. There are ways to treat it, but that actually included a portion of the supply chain that included sending it to Russia. Uh, for re-enrichment of uh, some material. So without going into too much of the details, we're just very excited to be able to reuse something that even the recyclers have trouble reusing. And uh, that was a successful test. We are able to take 150 grams of mock, of used mocks, particularly nasty stuff, and accurately, like to the T, determine what the concentrations of uranium, plutonium, minor actinides were going to be. And what we didn't realize is how it was eventually going to be what we do today and basically be the proof of concept of what we're trying to do now with Exodus Energy. And so in October 2022, uh, we realized that eight years later, the HALU issue has still not been solved. And so at that point, we decided to take less of a reactive development approach and pivot to be a fuel provider. First of all, nuclear waste management 
sure, from a technical perspective, is a well understood phenomena issue to, to handle, but it is a financial issue and it also is a social issue. You see that there's litigation. Yucca Mountain, which was a repository in Nevada, never came to be in the United States. In the United States, we have 90,000 tons of spent nuclear fuel. So, so essentially, we put this low enriched uranium uh, in a reactor, we consume roughly 5% of the energy content in there um, and actually less because we take it, out, take it out after like four and a half years. And so there's basically over 90% of the energy content that's still left in there. And so if we were able to repurpose all of that spent nuclear fuel, you'd have centuries of, of clean energy independence or at least you know fuel independence. So therein lies a beautiful opportunity to fuel all these advanced reactors. And a lot of them, some of them actually are thinking about turning to low enriched uranium, which requires a significant redesign of their system. What we would provide is actually a mock HALU, a pseudo HALU. So it wouldn't be 5% enriched U-235, but by removing excess uranium in that fuel rod, you're able to concentrate the plutonium isotopes that are in there. So you basically have U-235, PU-239, PU-241, and that serves as an alternative. Obviously, per vendor, it changes whether it's an 8%, 10%, 15% enrichment that they want. And essentially what we do in the recycling process is we chop the fuel rods, remove the gases at that point, put in a molten salt bath. Uh, so basically dissolve it in there. And once it's dissolved, remove the cladding that's in there, it tends to precipitate out. The vapor pressure of zirconium is, is much higher. So at 500 degrees Celsius, this flows to the top. But there are other uh, ways of removing the cladding that we're working on and that we're looking to develop with, uh, with argon uh, in this case. And um, the test that we did, by the way, was at uh, Idaho National Lab in the, in the hot fuel, um, in hot fuel, in the hot cell uh, it was, it's called the HFEF, Hot Fuel Examination Facility. And uh, what was interesting is, so I'm totally going on, on monologues here, so feel free to, to, to stop me whenever you want. Uh, but basically on, on, this, on this fuel front, we did that test and we realized that now, once you precipitate that zirconium, if you put in uh, an electro refiner, you're able to attract the uranium transuranics on the cathode and the fission products, alkali lanthanides, on the, the anode. Uh, so basically what you're recuperating on the cathode is what you're going to pull out, process through, and you're going to make a, an ingot of that metal, which we would then sell either through the vendors to fuel fab uh, facilities. There's a variety of ways in which you can make that work. If it's for a liquid fuel reactor, it's, it's even simpler. But coming back to, to, to that you know, fuel procurement uh, aspect, what's really important is that process in which we actually sparge that molten salt bath before we bring in the cathode with oxygen. And the reason why we do that is to be able to basically remove all that UO2 that's excess. And so, in fact, what's, what's pretty interesting is, you know, here's a, here's a sample. So for those that are on camera, this is depleted uranium. So it's in an ampule because if you, if you touch it with your fingers, it'll, it'll look like coal. It'll go black. This has like a couple of gold reflections, you know. Nice. Uh, it's pretty cool. But as you can see, this doesn't need to be concrete cask and, and dry cast. Or, oh, you, you can even break it. It's all good. <laughs> all right. As long as you don't eat it, you're all good. <laughs> all right. Yeah, seriously. There's nothing to worry about. Um, right. Check it out, guys. It's pretty cool. So. Awesome. Definitely, uh, is that, I, I love this gimmick. So this is only one gram. So yeah. you're not you're not talking about a significant load. But at the end of the day, that's roughly what we're what we're pulling out of of, of this process yeah. as like ninety percent of the volume. It's it, yeah, it's great to see the physical product, right? And also, um, you know, appreciate you sharing your journey and starting. You know how you how you got into the entrepreneurship scene and then going into starting your own company, right? Uh, it's pretty exciting. One question that I had for you, Carl is I'm interested in like, you know, when it comes to entrepreneurship, what was that like going into your school? What do folks uh, in your program, like did they ever think about starting a startup in nuclear? And what was kind of the first reactions that you got when you, when you took that, when you took that first step? So what, what, what's fascinating with, um, with the space is that today, if you tell someone that you're working on a nuclear technology, they'll say awesome. But in 2014, it was a mixture of how dare you. Uh, it was a mixture of oh you're making weapons, oh you're glowing in the dark, oh you're it, and and I think the 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 hardest part in entrepreneurship is not um, 
is not obviously doing it is 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 hard but it's it's mostly being undeterred and i was so fortunate to have a support system of professors mentors and even the nuclear industry was very open armed when when i first came in i mean we were 10 players. Just, just by incorporating the company, we were in the top 10 because it was, it was such a non... No one was thinking about it, you know, innovating in, in nuclear. And I have to be honest with you, if I were to start the business today, it, it would not be the same. I wouldn't have been able to be as exposed because back then in 2014, people were so much more open to sharing information on how the industry works. And it was, it was a, a, an amazing ground to learn and, and you had the ability to really engage with everyone. And the fact that it was a contrarian bet at the time allowed me personally to build eight years worth of knowledge on the regulatory space, on the manufacturing aspect, on actually the workforce development issues. So I, I definitely feel fortunate. Uh, and, and I think luck is a very important aspect as well in, in entrepreneurship. You meet one person who leads to the other. And I mean, with Elysium, we had roughly $10 million between equity, equity grants, uh, deferred uh, IP fees. So like, it, it was a pretty crazy engine. And uh, it was just amazing learning opportunity. I was most enamored by the people who believed in us, right? Here I am, 21 years old, and my co-founder is much older, has 30 plus years of, of nuclear engineering design expertise. Today, he would never team up with me, right? Whereas back then, no one was in the space, no one was that bold. Um, and, so, and so I think that there was room for people that were completely outside of the sector. Whereas now it's a bit more difficult. Although I really want everyone to succeed. And, I, and one of the reasons why we actually decided to get involved in the fuel recycling business is because we saw so many different reactor concepts coming up. But I mean, we had, we had homework assignments that I remember my co-founder at the time actually got a fail on one of his assignments because the professor was like, this is not a business. This is just an idea. So, so we, you know, coming back to that earlier, like not being deterred, the hard part is when everyone around you is calling you crazy but you still insist on doing it and you know you're right. And and that's, it's incredible how many people have actually reached out since then being like, oh, every time something, something, something happens in nuclear, I think about you guys. And, and I tell myself, wow, how you were right, like back in the day. And it's like, it doesn't matter to be right. What, what matters is, is, is to be successful um, at the end of the day. So, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Tell me a bit about your, you know, the, the mindset of an entrepreneur, right? So a lot of folks watching this in the industry are engineers right they're technical yeah. they're they're very uh they have very conservative mindset in terms of risk uh, risk tolerance right but the other side of the coin is the entrepreneur right very risk adverse you have to learn on the job right immediately like, like you know just sharing your journey of learning the regulatory piece learning the technical learning all of these things while at a fast pace because money's on the line tell me about that Yes, and and money on the line is like the key word, you know, key expression in, in your sentence because everything costs money. Your time costs money. You know, this 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 moment costs everything costs money. When the moment you you raise even a cent, it's it's you are now on someone else's dime. You need to make sure that you're delivering. You need to make sure that every single day you're putting out something that moves the needle forward. I heard it from an oil and gas man, but if you're not turning to the right, you need to always be churning. You always need to be delivering product. And so that creates environments that are particularly stressful. So what's most important is being able to work with people that you can disagree with because engineering is all about disagreeing. And it's all about compromise. It's funny because I, I would see so many, I wouldn't call them heated conversations because now in retrospect, you know, they weren't heated. It was just the engineering process. Obviously, when you when you break down entrepreneurship, it's sometimes it's idealized, right? As something in which you're the decider, you're the boss. That's true generally if you create a company and that you're selling products and you're not raising any external capital. And that leads to, to, to the other thing is that in the nuclear industry, very rarely are you gonna be able to start a business and then just generate revenue and go from there without any external capital. There are a couple of, of rare cases. I mean, Holtec is an amazing story of a thermal hydraulic engineer that goes into doing consulting and then eventually now manufactures the, the casts that are actually used for dry cast storage. Uh, uh, they develop their own reactor. I mean, they're, they're now all over the place. They have a massive manufacturing facility in, um, in Camden. New Jersey. So those are very like rare models of, of entrepreneurship in the nuclear space. But for the most part, what's hindered nuclear innovation is if you look at biotech, there is a lot of mergers and acquisitions activity. And that's the cheapest way to innovate. 
And a lot of the R&D, unfortunately, is being done within the corporates of the nuclear industry. And so corporates, by nature, especially if they're publicly traded or cannot necessarily innovate as much or take as much technical risk. And so that's where there's a lot of room for entrepreneurs to come into the game and take those risks because there are investors that are dedicated to allocating funds for those type of risks. And what's really important for anyone listening who's interested in creating their own venture or, or other, what's particularly important is understanding which problem are you solving, for who are you solving it, when do they need it solved? Because like, for example, nuclear waste, the only reason why there's an interesting time now is because we're getting to the point with the DOE violating their contract and not coming and picking up waste at, at the U.S. nuclear facilities since 1998, with the current interim storage sites that are being challenged legally by the governors that are signing actual bans and bringing spent nuclear fuel from other states, has created a situation in which there is an economic narrative for recycling and the waste minimization business. And interestingly enough, same thing with HALU. There's no HALU, so there's an interesting opportunity to be able to provide a feedstock material that can either mimic its neutronics or at least you know, help in, in adding more availability of, of a HALU or HALU type material. So there are these push and pull factors that make that it's the time that it's the right time. Right. But how many ideas were too early? I mean, frankly, our molten salt reactor concept in 2014, 2015 was, was, was too early in many regards. So there's an element of timing. There's an element of really understanding beyond what is the client need, how they work how the, the flows of money circulate within your clients. Utilities are very complex behemoths, uh, whether it's how they structure their power plant financing, they'll go to sovereign wealth funds, or in, you know, in the case of Canada, Ontario Teachers Pension Fund. And sometimes the utility is willing to take the risk, but not the product financier. So sometimes even if a utility wants an advanced reactor, the first questions that are gonna be arriving is, okay, how do you insure this facility? Is that a question that a lot of advanced reactor vendors are, are, are putting forward? I remember when we first engaged some of the, the their insurance companies, we were really the first at the time. So it just goes to show how even my approach being non-nuclear actually helped me better get involved in the nuclear space. So what's really important is also not being afraid to start something without all the competencies that you need. And the mentality at that point was, are we gonna go, am I gonna go study nuclear physics for the next 20 years? Or am I gonna team up with people who have been doing this for the last 30 years. And I would, all, I would go for the latter. So coming back to, to entrepreneurship, how to start, how, it, it, the first and the hardest part is just taking away the doubt and saying that no matter what problem you're gonna be facing, you're gonna surmount it. You're gonna have the curiosity to really go into the weeds. And that's what I did on, on the regulatory process because I knew that my expertise was not in you know, designing and avoiding helium embrittlement in the material. It was more so going through the 500 pages <laughs> of um, you know, different codes of federal regulations. But I would say that if, if you're an entrepreneur, work your way backward. Take the problem that you're addressing as opposed to, oh, this is a really cool technology that could be very efficient or okay, what, what problem are you solving? How does that problem get financed today? For example, utility, if they're gonna do little preliminary studies, that's in their R&D budget. That belongs to the, to the R&D manager. You don't need to bring the CEO for that. However, if you're trying to sell a reactor, then you need to be bringing the entire organization into it. And some facilities are actually co-owned by multiple utilities. So even a utility may not even have the final say on how to actually implement a solution at a site. So if I had one recommendation, it's be obsessed with how your client works or your target client works and what is the organizational structure there and who makes what decision and basically build a solution that little by little gets ingrained uh, in the process of, of these clients. All right. So tell me a bit about those relationships that you built, right? Like, what would you recommend? Like, for something like the nuclear industry, I wouldn't call it a cult, but I would say <laughs> it's a very small uh, industry, which is, which everyone knows everyone, right? How how do you get your way into that industry? How did you develop those relationships? And uh, eventually, how did you secure that capital that you need to start your startup? Yeah. So, so raising capital connects really with what I was saying earlier, which is really like working your way backward. Mm -hmm. Okay, at scale, who will fund the solution? How will it be funded? Okay, great. Once that's checked off the box, it's mostly understanding, understanding who are the investors for what phase. And then once you go back from the infrastructure funds, then right before it's, okay, 
private equity. How does private equity invest? What are their target return rates? What are the timelines on their due diligence process? Uh, what are other portfolio companies that could be helpful? Try to speak with founders that are funded by these different investors before even taking their check because you don't know how they're going to behave on your cap table once mm -hmm. they have. So, so even just understanding the target returns for the funds, doing your homework will allow you to save so much more time in raising capital. And in fact, a lot of the times, just being organized is an important element. How many founders have I seen raise funds for ideas that were either less better than what you know some competitors were doing, but, but what they were doing is they were being organized and they looked like an engineering organization. And that, when you're speaking with startups, it's always a messy environment because you want to have cheap innovation. So you don't want to have a quality assurance program too soon in the process because otherwise that's a very expensive design decision when you go from one idea to the other. So just being organized, doing your proper homework on who are, and frankly, the private equity groups at that stage are your clients because you're not trying to actually deploy these at scale just yet. They're helping you ramp up the process. And then taking a step back from private equity, then you have the VC funds. The VC funds are here to make either technical risk. A lot of the times they don't want to go for commercial risk, which is why it's super important to work your way back as opposed to, I'll, I'll just give you an example, but my mentor, his, his nickname, Professor Yasuhiro Yamakawa, who's been my professor since freshman year at Babson, his nickname is Dr. Failure. And it makes people laugh, right? Because like Dr. Failure, oh, I don't want this professor. He's going to teach me all about failure. And it's like, on the contrary, succeeding is the avoidance of failure. It's having the most extensive and, and detailed risk register. It's not about having a one-off path. It's 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 what are all the different paths that you can take if this is a no, right? So a lot of times, like you know, in the reactive space, you'll say, oh yeah, this is you know for DoD purposes. So so great. There's definitely a market there. But as I said, with the naval reactor program, like you have like 400 reactors. So like there's definitely a big market. But like in terms of how many reactors are going to be bought, you know, by just a DoD, like that's that's a pretty risky bet if that's your only potential target market. So you, you, you really need to be able to have plan B, plan C, plan D, because there's no such thing as a plan. And sometimes, like even in, in my case, by switching from Elysium to Exodus, you see that certain you know pivots you didn't even think about, but opportunities just come about. So you also need to be open-minded. You need to be open-minded so that when someone comes to you with an idea, or you can hear it. And coming back to whether it's investors or utilities, the most important is listening. Because when you're talking, you're not learning anything. You're just exposing your ideas and your and your opinions. And sometimes you'll end up having people, you know, kind of like, you know, twisting their tongue or, you know, tilting their head because like they don't necessarily agree. And the most important thing that we did in, in 2014, 2015, when we started a company, I didn't know anything about designing a reactor. But what I could do is speak to all the people who have failed in the past and understand why they failed. And it, they all fail for different reasons, either too many cooks in the kitchen for the design work, either bringing a quality assurance program too soon in the process, which basically inhibits, you're getting to the point where it's like, okay, you know what, let's just stick with this. And, and unfortunately, you actually also have to make decisions at times, which are not optimal, but you gotta run with it. Because otherwise you're not building anything. There's no such thing as a perfect system. So when it comes to raising capital, you need to be able to show that you understand all those different elements. And when it comes to building, frankly, the nuclear industry is 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 a great industry because it's so easy to meet everybody, right? So yeah, it's a closed circle, but it's actually a closed circle that's much more open to innovation than many people think. Because the reason why the industry was in its very difficult position is because it did not innovate, because it didn't listen to the outside world. I think that transparency could have avoided so much anti-nuclear sentiment. And so, of course, you're not going to be revealing the specifics of the design of your reactor. But I mean, if you're not open, then you're hiding something. And with social media and with, with all these different, you know, your podcast there's opportunity to be transparent. And so that's also a big boon for the nuclear industry. But the most important is, is just listening and getting in there. And what's interesting is in the nuclear industry, we have a little generational gap. Like there's a good like 15 year gap of people who just didn't want to design or, or, or study nuclear engineering. And so a lot of what even I do as a CEO is knowledge management. It's just, how can we take what these 30 plus year nuclear designers, nuclear waste recyclers, et cetera, have done and make sure that that is, that is passed along to the younger engineers coming on. So you're not repeating certain mistakes and you're not building first of a kinds as if they were first of a kinds. So to kind of like give an overall conclusion to how do you raise funds? How do you get active in, in, in the sector? The most important is just being social, being, being out there, asking questions, because more often than not, I've rarely 
if ever come across someone in the nuclear industry that would say, uh, oh, I can't answer that question or I'm not interested in that. In fact, sometimes it's, it's viewed as its flaw. The fact that you'll ask a question and they'll talk your ear off. But if you take notes, that's incredibly valuable data. Yeah, that's that's great. That's great that you're you 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 had that you know that you had that positive experience uh, with the industry, right? Um, and I'm I'm glad I'm glad you had that experience. And it's also really insightful to hear that you went back to to various companies to hear about not their successes, but actually their failures, right? When I look at companies across the world, like Samsung or many other big, big companies, they started by, you know, selling fish, right? And then kind of scaling up and then iterating, iterating upon iterating. So I feel like, you know, the story that you shared with Molten Salt Reactor, which is now your company's trajectory is going more toward fuel reprocessing. I see that iteration, right? So tell me about that journey of iteration and how an entrepreneur needs to have an open mindset. I think it's easier said than done, right? It's very difficult, but, but tell me about that. There, there's a general principle that I try to live by is you never lose if you can't, right? If you're in the mindset that whatever you learn, whatever you go through, even if it's a commercial success or a commercial failure, is always going to be success, right? And at one point we're saying, yeah, these companies were talking about their failures, but their failures is actually their success because that's the engineering process. You don't learn anything about a material when you don't break it. Mm. When you're doing irradiation on a material, it, it's funny. I, I even learned this with our CTO, you know, with Ed. He'd say, no, you want to break things so you're able to know when, when, when you need to change them, right? Whereas if something's just working and an experiment is, is, is working, then you, you don't learn a whole lot from that because you, you want to get to the limit. Applying the same principle with, with the molten salt reactor, in, in certain respects, I would, I would call it a failure because it was a very interesting solution. And what was driving a lot of the utility's interest was the ability to reuse their waste. So I realized that that was a big element for utilities, the realization of waste, and that they were willing to open their eyes to a, to a reactor with a much lower TRL, technology readiness level, relative to light water reactors, et cetera, because of that waste minimization aspect. So I told myself, that's something to, to hold on to. And the other thing is, again, when we started, there were maybe like 10 companies in the space trying to build a reactor. So when we came in, it was us, a couple of startups, and the incumbents like BWXT, Westinghouse, GE. So even being able to get FaceTime with those groups and, and, and the, the heads of those organizations was amazing because I was also the young guy that was non-threatening. So, so they were happy to, 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 to talk about their experiences because they, they, you know, that knowledge transfer is important to them. They're reaching the end of their careers for a couple and they wanna, as much as possible, make sure that whatever they learn is put to use. And, and that's how a lot of our people on, on our team at Exodus feel, right? They've spent over 30 years designing reactors or in the case of Jean-Christophe, designing recycling production lines at La Hague. And all they want to do is be able to transfer that knowledge to younger, younger talent. And a lot of what you're seeing here is you're seeing a lot of engineers from other disciplines or other types of companies that are non-nuclear getting into the nuclear space, which is awesome. But what that also means is that the first dollars that you give them is basically just to learn up on how the regulatory process works, et cetera. So like there's a penalty to pay from, from, from that regard. But today you have a lot of advanced reactor vendors. You can't even keep track anymore. Uh, and there's so many that are not even, you know, still flying uh, stealth mode. Clearly, the word is out that nuclear is going to be super important. And where I think there lies an incredible amount of opportunity is actually in everything around the reactor. Because it's funny, but when we started the molten salt reactor, it, it was, okay, we need to develop new pumps, we need to develop new heat exchangers, we need, we need to do new fuel qualification, uh, we need to be able to uh, design canisters that can take high uh, burn up uh, fuel uh, uh, for storage. and ten, 10 startups in one. <laughs> that's exactly the problem. It's 10 startups in one. And, and what I love is there are a couple of companies and a, and a couple of entrepreneurs that are, are really taking that to heart and realizing that there's so much money and value to make in actually some of the more platform enabling solutions for the rest of the nuclear industry. And so part of that pivot was saying, we have recycled 150 grams of used mocks, which is really challenging. Let's use all that knowledge. Let's use all the criticality analyses and thermal analyses that we've done for a molten salt bath with uranium, plutonium, and, and minor actinides and fission products in it, and just repurpose all that data <laughs> uh, to basically design a molten salt-based recycling system. So thankfully, we weren't working on another type of reactor because had we done so, it'd be so much more difficult to make that pivot because you're going from you know, apples to oranges. But because we're designing a molten salt reactor, fast chloride reactor too, 
and quiet salts are the one used in power processing, it was just a natural pivot for us. Um, and frankly, it's it's even more gratifying because it's a, new, it's a much near term business when it comes to engaging with utilities. But on top of that, it's it's really been a wonderful experience speaking with so many vendors and helping them design their reactor. And, and you feel less of a competitive aspect when you're speaking with everyone because you're not telling yourself there's finite money going around amongst investors. There's finite utilities. Uh, they're only going to buy one reactor. I mean, now there's so much more bullish, whether it's the investment community. I mean, we saw yesterday or uh, even utilities uh, in their integrated resource planning. So it's gotten to the point now where it's OK. Yes, there are these promising technologies. We have all the vendors. There's more capital going in. But the reason why it's not happening is because there's not enough work being done all around. And so, for example, uh, Ryan Pickering, you know, a nuclear advocate, um, he's looking at ways to reform the reactor purchasing model for utilities or even collectives of, of micro utilities. And that's the type of innovation that we need throughout the value chain. And so what we really try to do more than anything is position ourselves as an ally to the rest of the industry. Because we're not even competing with Halu Provision. You, you, have, you have reactor concepts that are in, interested in having both. It's just that you, you have such little Halu available that we need to put everything that we can uh, into pushing the industry forward. Like TerraPower delayed their reactor from 2028 to 2030, the deployment of their sodium, of their natrium, because of the lack of halo availability. So that hurts the in industry as a whole. And so we need to be able to have more entrepreneurship and some of these more, what you're doing with, with, with nuclear advocacy and podcasts and bringing information to the forefront in a technical yet you know understandable manner is, is, is a game changer. Because I sure hope that a lot of people that are listening to this are not from the nuclear sector and realizing that they can embolden themselves to get in here because I knew nothing. I mean, my nickname at home is Two Left Hands. No one trusts me by, with an Ikea table or anything. So it's, it's just know what you know and or understand what little you know about a certain area. Just focus on that and then surround yourself with, with way smarter people. You don't have to have all the answers. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think this was this was definitely very insightful. I know a lot of folks in the audience may or may not come from a nuclear background, but it's it's a really unique story, right? Seeing a 21 year old, you're not 21 anymore. I'm, <laughs> I'm loving the view from here. I just turned 30. I love it. <laughs> okay, fast forward nine years, but 21 getting into the entrepreneurship scene, seeing seeing that vision from nuclear energy, and being inspired by uh, life events, right? Like 9/11 like that 2003, that blackout, right. major blackout, and really utilizing that that fuel ambition, channeling it towards towards a startup, right? So I really enjoyed uh, learning your learning about your journey, your experiences, and, and I, I'm sure those in the audience have really enjoyed that as well. So thanks again, Carl. Really appreciate you hosting me here in New York City. Thanks a lot. <laughs> oh, thank, you know, thank you again for, for, for hosting me and you know, anyone that's even in the audience listening, you know, I don't know if my, uh, my email or something or coordinates will, will be added, but don't, don't ever hesitate to reach out. And what made my adventure work is the fact that I was unafraid to cold email people and they were responsive. If you don't try to reach out to someone, then, then you'll never get a hold of them. And what's good is that the industry is still small enough where you can do that. But I think that in three, four years, there's going to be so many players, there's going to be so much more capital injected in here that it's going to get harder to get a hold of, of everyone. Now, I'm not saying it's gonna be harder to get a hold of me, but but that's also something to be mindful of, is just, just reaching out to people. So that's how we met as well. So just you know, super grateful that you're able to, to come here, visit us and uh, and be in New York for New York City Climate Week. And uh, looking forward to your talk that's gonna be coming up as well. So uh, so yeah, thank you to the entire audience and, uh, and hopefully talk soon with some of you. Thanks. Take care, guys. Bye.